So next up, we have Emily uh, Lakdawala talking about taking passengers on planetary exploration vessels, benefits of engaging space, en space enthusiast communities with rapidly released image data. The floor is yours. All right, so hi, and thanks for the invitation to speak to you at this conference. I'm uh, honored to participate, and um, I hope you enjoy the uh, presentation that I have for you. I'm here to advocate for the public. Uh, that's been my role um, for uh, quite a long time now. Um, before I get started, though, I should mention that, um, uh, if I can get this slide to advance. There we go. Okay, um, all of the images that you'll see in this presentation are courtesy of NASA or NASA JPL, unless I note otherwise. Um, and the images that are in this presentation that are not um, from any NASA or any other government agency that have been, um, that are derived products may be copyright copyrighted. So, um, like a lot of people, my interest in planetary exploration began in the 1980s with the flybys of uh, the giant planets of our solar system by the Voyager missions. And um, I was captivated as a kid by the, uh, even these kind of very fuzzy images of the moons of Saturn and um, Jupiter and Uranus and Neptune. The ones of Uranus in particular had lovely names like Miranda, Ariel, Umbriel, Titania, and Oberon. These pictures are not the highest quality images we have of targets in, in deep space, um, but they were brand new worlds. And I think that uh, the public tends to be really inspired every time we see a new world in space. Just imagine um, the excitement when we first encountered the rubber duck shape of Rosetta's comet turyumov gerasimenka I'm very excited about the Lucy mission that just launched that's going to be seeing a whole lot of strange potato shaped new worlds once it finally um, encounters them and the Trojan clouds uh, before uh, in advance and, and behind Jupiter. Um, uh, but at the time, I was just an impressionable kid, and I uh, didn't really think that I could possibly have a career in space. I studied a lot of science. I went on to do geology, and I became a science teacher. And it was while I was a science teacher in uh, 1996, 1997, that um, some very exciting things were happening in space. There was this landing on Mars of this uh, lander, Mars Pathfinder, with this very charismatic little rover. And all of this was happening at the same time that the uh, World Wide Web, this absolutely new creation, was just getting underway. And NASA began with Pathfinder, a tradition of sharing images out to the World Wide Web, um, and so that they invited the public along to enjoy the, uh, the drama, the um, adventure of exploring a new place, a new planet, via the venue of images shared across the internet. And it's something that's just expanded and um, grown more important ever since. At the same time, um, Galileo was also returning images of, of those moons of Ju Jupiter that I had so enjoyed in the Voyager pictures when I was a kid. And having my geology degree and seeing these images, I suddenly had this epiphany, can you do geology in space? So it turns out you could. I went to Brown to study geology and there I made a discovery that would change my life. It's not the kind of discovery that you publish in a journal. No, it's the discovery that there is a vast quantity of data, as you all know, that's um, been returned from numerous missions across the solar system, and that it's actually available to the public. This was a revelation to me. I spent uh, my two years at Brown rifling through cabinets when uh, looking at these wonderful images of Venus from Magellan when I should have been working on my thesis. And I realized that I'd found my calling, that what I really wanted to do was to share these images with the public, to let the public know that these images existed um, and that there are so many more images of these other worlds of the solar system than are generally um, visible to the public because they're in this, uh, this treasure trove, this library of data that most people don't know about and don't know how to access. Well, fortunately, um, a year after graduating from, um, from Brown, I was able to get a job that allowed me to do this kind of proselytizing to the public about space image data. I joined the Planetary Society in 2001 in order to work on a education project associated with the Mars Exploration Rovers and initiated by these two young men, Steve Squires and Jim Bell, who were involved in leading the Mars Exploration Rover mission. Steve Squires is a principal investigator, Jim Bell was the head of the camera instrument. 
And they had this idea of sharing all of the images from the rovers to the public as soon as they landed on Earth. This was very different from what has been done in the past and what's been done on most missions, to be honest. Most missions wait um, for a certain period of time, uh, months to years, before sharing their data to the public through data archives. But Squires and Bell decided that they wanted the public to join this adventure as Pathfinder had before, and that was uh, Matt Gollenbeck was in charge of that one. And so on landing day, you can see here on your screen some of the very first images that were returned from Spirit, the same images that we saw in mission operations, the rest of the world could see at the same time. These um, uh, somewhat funny looking images show the rover still on its landing deck and actually the camera mast hasn't even opened up yet. So you're, you're looking down the mast before the, the camera mast is raised up. And so a huge international community developed around these rapidly released images. There were just people around the world who were able to um, download these images and follow the adventure. You can see in this image that they um, followed uh, that uh, some of the amateurs noticed this dust devil before uh, NASA or JPL had a chance to write a press release about, oh, we found dust devils on Mars. And so um, this, by sharing these raw images with the public, um, the mission was able to generate a lot of excitement, a lot of loyalty, a lot of interest and education about what it takes to explore space. The experiment was so successful that JPL repeated it with the Cassini spacecraft um, just six months later when it went to orbit at Saturn. And um, after the Mars Exploration Rover project, uh, the education project that I was working on ended, I was tapped to start educating the public, as had been my hope, about how to use these images, how to process them, and how to make the most of them. Um, just a, another six months later, the Huygens probe landed on Titan, and their images were released to the internet somewhat inter inadvertently, but almost immediately after they arrived. And um, at the same time that the uh, that European Space Agency was releasing um, image panoramas that looked like this, there were members of the public who were producing images like this. This is a panoramic view of the landing site taken um, by Huygens and showing kind of the color of Titan sky and of uh, the just strangely seaside looking landscape that um, Huygens saw as it descended. So when I discovered, I discovered that amateur community, um, uh, I discovered that amateur community when I was working as a journalist covering, covering the uh, Huygens landing. And I immediately needed to find out who these people were, um, what motivated them, um, how they can aid space exploration and education, um, and how I can help them, what barriers they face that prevent more people from participating in the very fun activity of processing space image data in order to produce beautiful photos. So, um, after taking, after spending a lot of time within this community, I just I figured out that the major motivating question that a lot of people ask, who want to do this kind of image processing, is what would it look like if I were there in space looking at this target with my own eyes? If instead of a robotic spaceship, it was actually a spaceship carrying humans, what would it look like outside the porthole window? And so. Um, this uh, means that they have very different goals in mind when it comes to processing images than scientists do. So um, here's an example of a pair of images of uh, Venus that were produced by um, uh, two different missions, Magellan and Galileo, and they were both released by the, the missions in order to do some uh, public science education. The Magellan one is a radar image it shows you the surface of the planet as seen in radar data. And then the other image shows you the, um, the upper cloud decks of uh, Venus. Um, and it shows you, uh, you know, the, uh, what Galileo could see through an ultraviolet filter. And so both of these images were released. They're, they're some of the most commonly reproduced images of Venus that you can see across the internet. And neither of them actually looks like what it would look like if you were there. And so here's one of my favorite images produced by one of the amateur image processors, a guy named Matthias Malmer, Swedish guy. Um, and this is a global view. It's a very high resolution view actually of Venus from Mariner 10. He has incorporated a little bit of ultraviolet data so that you see a little bit more in the way of cloud features than you would if you were there. Um, but at the same time, it presents a much more realistic view, a much more natural color view of what Venus would look like than those previous images that I showed you from the science releases. If you want to know what Venus would really look like if you were there, you can use uh, messenger data 
data. This is a color image of Venus processed by um, a Croatian guy named uh, Gordon Ugarkovic um, that shows you uh, what what Venus looks like. It looks like a cue ball. And so this is not an image that really edifies you very much scientifically, but it does answer that question of what would Venus look like while you were there. Here's another of my favorite examples, two of the most commonly reproduced images of Neptune and Uranus from Voyager 2. And you see this sharp color contrast with Neptune being dark blue and Uranus being vaguely aqua colored, when in fact, if you process the images to um, to simulate what human perception would look like, uh, this is the contrast between them. They're really very similar looking planets. Uranus at the time that Voyager 2 passed by was um, had quite a lot less cloud features than Neptune did. It actually probably looks a lot more like Neptune now that the seasons have been turning over. And so here's a montage that I put together of all the planets um, and moons of the solar system using amateur processed images to represent them um, as close to natural color as they were capable of producing. And I feel like it, it makes a much more natural, a prettier illustration. Again, it may be less useful for science, um, but it does, uh, it, it has a really high illustration value. So uh, what do artists need if we're going to be helping them out? Um, they need data. They need metadata that describes uh, what the data, um, what is in the data. They need data and metadata in order to be able to browse and search. They need tools that help them zero in on the data that they're looking for um, to find the kinds of data that will allow them to produce these beautiful um, illustrations. They need batch download tools that make it easy to download large quantities of data that doesn't require them to know a scripting language. Because a lot of these people, they're artists, they're not coders. And so they need help with these, um, with these activities in order to be able to get at the data that they need. They need processing tools that they can understand how to use, or even better, already calibrated or reprojected products that are more accessible to them. Just in general, um, you need to, uh, the most of these artists with a few exceptions, notable exceptions, um, don't have the technical expertise necessary to interact with these gargantuan archival data sets. They need things provided to them in easier to access ways in order to be able to do the kind of work that they're capable of doing. Um, what do you get from these artists if you support them? The obvious answer being gorgeous illustrations for your work. Uh, a favorite example of mine for this is the Voyager 2 Miranda data set, which is one of the gnarliest data sets from the Voyager 2 mission. Voyager 2 flew past um, a very small moon, Miranda, quite close by. It's a 500 kilometer moon. Um, and it at the time was not able to take images in very rapid succession because in part of, of the um, low light levels at Uranus. So even though it got this really pretty uh, set of images, there's a, a total of eight images of Miranda um, for this mosaic, there's a lot of perspective change between them and Miranda is a very lumpy moon. So if you go to the JPL website and you look for the officially released uh, mosaics that were produced from this data set, these are the two options you get. The first one is a kind of poorly puzzle pieced version that's basically just made by sliding the images around and trying to match them up as best as you can. Um, but because of the perspective changes, they don't uh, match together very well. The other one is a reprojected version that has also had um, the photometric um, uh, changes uh, taken out, so it looks very flat. This is a version that was produced for mapping purposes in order that they could map all of those groovy features on Miranda. And it's definitely a much better mosaic than the other one, but it also doesn't look like a moon floating in space. And so here's a version of that data set that was produced by um, an amateur named Ted Strike. In order to do this, he had to do a lot of manual warping. He also replaced some data with some lower resolution data um, that was to cover one area on the limb that wasn't covered by the high resolution data set. This is far from a scientific product. It is not, it is slightly fictional because he has been, uh, he kind of rubber sheet warped things in order to fit them together, not using mathematical reprojection. Um, but it's a much prettier illustration and it's a better, it forms a better impression in people's minds of what the moon Miranda would really look like if you were there. Um, here's another example of Ted Strike's work that I really like. So this one begins with some cleaned up versions of uh, Russian Venera lander data showing the surface of Venus. 
You can see the top one has some platy lava flows, the bottom one has some blocky lava flows. And here are versions that Ted Strike created using those images as the kind of raw material for these artworks. If you go back and forth between them, you can see that the pictures of the surface of Venus that he created are based on reality, um, but they're not they're not real places. These are not actual photographs. They are artistic products based on a true story is kind of how I like to describe these images. But they help the, the public perceive, uh, understand much better what these original very warped um, uh, odd perspective images um, actually look like, what the surface of Venus may actually look like. And then my last example of this is, is something that I like. I love producing these scale image montages. Um, but one thing that always bothers me when I see them in presentations is that people often have everything like rotated every which direction with respect to each other. And it looks very false. It looks, uh, uh, it's disconcerting to have the illumination coming from multiple different directions. So I just scale everything and then rotate everything so that the sun is coming from the top and then everything hangs together much more pleasingly. In this particular combination, I also um, tried my best to adjust the levels of each of the images to reflect their actual albedo. And so you can see the huge albedo contrast between things like um, uh, comet nuclei, like at the bottom, you can see Halley, Borelli, Temple 1, Built 2, Hartley 2, and uh, Churyumov Gerasimenka, and the rest are visited asteroids. And uh, you can see how much brighter most of the asteroids are than the visited comets. So uh, in addition to getting um, excellent illustrations, you can also, uh, by engaging with these artists, you can crowdsource your PR. You can get a lot more conversation about space missions, space missions happening across social media and in, in, um, you know, it, it broadens your impact a great deal. Um, so here are some examples of uh, some really amazing uh, amateur image data artists. There's Gordon Ugarkovic, who I've mentioned previously. Thomas Appare mostly works on Mars. Um, Judy Schmidt does a lot of really amazing work with uh, telescopic data. Justin Cowart is uh, a man after my own heart. He, he does everything. So this screen cap from his Flickr shows Rosetta images and, and Saturn and Mars. Uh, some of these Mars images are from Viking. So it just goes to show the kinds of work that can still be done with very old data. And then when I was at the Planetary Society, um, I created a uh, landing page where I um, collected some of the better examples of amateur processed images, and I did my best to connect them with metadata that described um, which mission, when, uh, what filters, um, all that kind of information, so that you have a little bit more information available than you typically do when you see these things shared on social media across the internet. Um, the only thing about uh, working with amateurs is, is, of course, you have to remember that they're volunteers. And so um, even there are some missions like JunoCam has actually used volunteer help in order to process their raw images into beautiful um, processed works. JunoCam is not a science instrument. It was put on the Juno mission purely for EPO purposes. And so they don't have a team. They don't have a, a science team whose task it is to process the images. Instead, they rely on volunteers, members of the public, who then submit their products back to the NASA website. And they've produced some really glorious work with the JunoCam data. Um, some of them even have very scientific approaches. So John Rogers has been observing Jupiter for a long time with the telescope. And so he takes these images um, and identifies the, the belt and cloud features within them. Of course, not everything that the public submits is, uh, you know, quality enough for hanging on your wall, but it's fun. You know, people do enjoy a great deal having the opportunity to interact with missions in this way, and it really does engage the public. So I'm gung-ho for even the most, uh, um, you know, psychedelic versions of the Juno image data. So um, the last few minutes of this talk, I'm going to talk about how to help uh, amateurs access this data. Most amateurs prefer to use um, those kinds of data sets that are rapidly released to the internet. This is confusingly referred to as raw data, um, but it's not the same thing that most of us are, are thinking of when we think about raw data. For them, raw refers to the rapid release data. So these, these data are released by certain missions uh, straight to the website. They're available nearly in real time after they've landed on Earth. Sometimes there's a short delay of a day or a few, but most of the time they're available really quickly. Um, these data usually go through an automated pipeline that does not include calibration or flat fielding or, or other steps like that. 
They're also usually automatically contrast, stretch, contrast stretched and um, saved in some kind of lossy compression format, which makes them more accessible in terms of being able to see and understand the pictures and download them quickly. But it also reduces the, the data quality substantially. Um, it would be nice if these artists were using the archival data, the much higher quality data, but they find it very difficult to discover and to use it. Some, uh, there are a few missions currently sharing this kind of raw image. Um, these are kind of raw images and I've got a list of them here. I can put more links to these websites in the Discord later on after my talk. Um, and there's some, uh, a large number of missions have done it in the past and have engaged with the public really effectively this way. There are a few missions and cameras that work very hard to release their archival quality data very quickly. So Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter High Rise releases as fast as one month after data acquisition. The Rosetta Navcams um, got uh, up to near real-time release toward the end of their mission, and Bepi Colombo MCAMs are, are, I think, on only a three-week delay. And then um, one thing that I think is very cool is that the uh, director's discretionary time that's awarded on the Hubble Space Telescope, those data become available to the public almost immediately. There are some really excellent browse tools out there, and I've put links to these in the Discord um, for this talk. My favorite one is the Opus Rings Node search tool, which displays you your search results using colorized versions of all the images that um, that show you uh, what kind of kind of intuitively what color filter they were taken through. So I can say, aha, this particular image set has a red, green, red, green, blue filter combination that I can use to combine into a color image of Saturn. And so it makes it much easier and more intuitive to search through the um, archival data. I served uh, earlier this year on an independent review board that NASA convened to look at the whole planetary data ecosystem and say, um, what, uh, what kind of work does NASA need to do to make its data more accessible, usable, um, machine, uh, you know, uh, operatable? Um, I headed up the searching subcommittee and we issued a, a report um, in April 2021 offering advice to NASA on how to do a, a on what kinds of actions to take in order to make the planetary data ecosystem um, more effective and more accessible. Uh, we found that there is a huge tension between um, the uh, preservation of data and its discovery and usability. So that NASA's planetary data system is really excellent at preserving data, but their mandate wasn't originally to do any um, to make it especially discoverable or usable, especially to communities who were not working on the mission itself. It was mostly about preserving, saving the data for use by um, future researchers. And so uh, that has resulted in a situation where um, understanding how to discover and to use data really depends on your having access to other members of the science community and people working at data archives. And this is all fine and good if you are a graduate student um, with a mentor who can help you out or if you're an employee at a NASA center, but if you're a member of the public, you don't usually have that kind of access. And so there are insurmountable barriers to understanding where to find, how to find, and how to use this kind of data. Um, there are problems like there being too many portals, steep learning curves for using the data, um, and the fact that a lot of the data that's uh, that's preserved is low level data that requires calibration in order to be able to use it. There are some missions that um, archive calibrated versions of their data sets and I love them very much because I don't have access to IDL or other tools that are commonly used by people in the community to do the calibration steps. And I don't code, so I can't uh, write my own scripts to do that. So there are ways that this community can help uh, increase public access to data. Uh, by doing things like building browse tools, simply writing the instructions in uh, more accessible ways on websites. Um, that includes, uh, you know, simpler language makes it more accessible, accessible to people who don't have specialized education. It also makes those websites work better with machine translation to make them accessible to people um, in countries uh, who do not speak English as their first language or as their um, scientific language. Um, it's uh, useful to make data available in more common lossless formats like ping. And there are a couple of missions, notably InSight, which is now sharing its data in ping format. Um, and then it would be great if there could be easy to use maybe browser-based tools for common processing tasks like making anaglyphs, color combinations, animations, that sort of thing.
And so that's just a high level overview of the kinds of um, work that amateurs do and, um, and uh, the kinds of things that they need in order to, to help them do their work more effectively. And if we can increase access to all of these amazing images, then we can uh, really get a lot more public education about our space missions and also invite a lot more people to participate in a way that I think will make them gung-ho su supporters of future space exploration. So thank you very much and I welcome questions. Thank you very much, Emily, for um, a stimulating talk with some beautiful images. Um, we have a few questions in, the, in, in Discord. Um, the first is uh, from Ketchil Kirkham. In the naturalistic image of the planets made by space enthusiasts, why is Jupiter's South Pole not blue, as in the Juno NASA images? Ah, um, that, that is because of uh, perspective. Um, it's because uh, when you look at, uh, uh, my understanding is that when you look at Jupiter's poles from a shallow angle, um, you're looking through a lot more of the upper atmosphere. There's a lot more haze and it kind of grays out the, um, the color of the poles. But if, you're, if you have a more um, down perspective on them, then you're seeing more directly that blue color. Um, so I think it's just a, a, a scattering effect it's a limb, um, it's like a limb brightening effect, I think. But uh, you'll have to ask a more expert person on Jupiter's atmosphere to, to see if my answer is correct on that one. Thanks. Um, there's also some discussion on the provenance of um, some of these images shared as JPEGs in, on public websites. Perhaps you can, you can comment on that. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. So um, a question from Peter Tubin was, you know, is, is good prominence always shown for some of the JPEGs that are shown on public websites in the, in whether it's just a caption on the side, where this actually comes from and differentiating from artistic versus scientific, uh, more, more science ready images. So um, when, uh, if you're talking about images that are shared by the missions themselves, um, yes, they do share some metadata with it. Um, they typically share things like uh, time of acquisition, um, camera uh, that was used. They may share range or, um, information, location information, um, that kind of thing. So there is some metadata that's shared. Uh, one of the things that is not commonly shared that I really wish was is, is that nearly every image from any, every mission is taken with some kind of observation identification or a scientific justification. And so you might have images that were it's like, you know, part of an observation made um, for a global mapping of a world, for instance. And when the Cassini images were shared, you didn't get that information with uh, released with the JPEGs. Now, the Cassini mission did share observation plans for each uh, of the targeted flybys. So you could put that together with um, images that were the JPEG images that were released, but that was an extra step that while I was interested in doing it, a lot of members of the public wouldn't have, wouldn't have done that. And so um, that limits the usefulness of some of the images, but uh, they did share enough usually to identify the target of the images and the time of day and you know things like that. So they do share some metadata. Great, thank you. Um, there are a, a suite of new questions coming in the Discord, but we've unfortunately run out of time. But uh, let's all thank Emily again for a stimulating talk and some beautiful imagery. Thanks very much.